This lesson is going to explore how life originated on Earth. What are the molecular originations of life as we see it today? So in order to explore this, we first need to understand, well, what is life? What are these characteristics we're looking for if we're going to understand the origins of all the biological systems we currently see? Most scientists agree that life is anything that has the following characteristics. Living things are a cell or are organized as cells. Living things regulate internal processes. They're able to maintain their temperature, their pH, doing something called homeostasis. They're able to obtain and use energy to grow. They have a metabolism. They're able to reproduce and make more copies of themselves, and they evolve as the environment around them changes. That drives how they change. So in understanding how life originated, we need to think, how did chemicals, non-living, inorganic particles, achieve these characteristics? How do we go from a bunch of chemicals to cells, homeostasis, metabolism, and evolution? There are three primary hypotheses that are currently being explored with the origins of life. One hypothesis is a special creation hypothesis, the idea that life was created by a supernatural or divine force. This hypothesis is not testable. This is a hypothesis you can't experiment on, so it is outside the realm of scientists. No biologist is currently exploring that as an avenue for understanding how life originated. Another hypothesis that's being researched is extraterrestrial. Perhaps the or original sources the organic compounds, the lipids, the nucleic acids that form life forms were brought here, from Earth, brought here from space, perhaps by an asteroid or a comet. This is testable. We're able to go out and measure and experiment on objects and particles that fall on Earth from space. And that research has actually shown that organic compounds, nucleic acids, are found on objects outside of our planet. And then there's the spontaneous abiotic origin hypothesis. Did life evolve from inorganic molecules? If you get organic chemistry in the right location at the right time with the right energy source, could that lead you on the pathway to life? This too is testable. Science can recreate these conditions and see what happens, see if we get the molecular chemistry and ultimately the structures that living things exhibit. So if we're gonna understand how life started on Earth, we wanna know what Earth was like before life appeared. So what were the early conditions on Earth? Well, we're pretty confident that early, Earth's early atmosphere had water vapor, carbon dioxide, nitrogen, nitrous oxides, hydrogens, ammonias, methanes, and sulfides. For energy sources, early Earth had lightning, it had UV radiation entering our planet from the sun, and volcanic activity arising from underneath the Earth's surface. What is missing in this concoction that we currently have all over Earth? Oxygen. Early Earth had very little to no oxygen on it. Oxygen came later from some processes we'll discuss. So to test the spontaneous origin theory, in 1952, Miller and Ure created an experiment. They tried to recreate the conditions of early Earth and see what would happen. Will we get the organic chemistry needed for life? So they made this apparatus. They had water heated at one end that produced water vapor where there was methane, ammonia, hydrogen, and electric spark to recreate the lightning storms that we knew were existing on Earth and a condenser to recreate cold environments. After running this experiment, they actually were able to have amino acids, the foundation of all proteins, and adenine nucleotides, one of the four nucleotides in DNA, up here. This gained huge accolades and is a huge piece of evidence to support the spontaneous origin theory. This showed that organic molecules can arise from inorganic molecules. And this is why today the spontaneous origin theory is the predominant avenue most scientists are exploring for the origins of life on Earth. So now that we have the ingredients for life, we at least have proteins and nucleic acids established, how can we go from the soup of ochem to the first cell? Well, you would need some kind of early bubble or membrane, some kind of a container that we refer to as a protobuoyant. And we see these form in nature today. Bubbles can arise and bubbles can form inside these bubbles. This is absolutely essential for a cell to form. If you're going to have any kind of metabolism or chemistry, you need a way of separating your insides from the outsides to make the conditions for a reaction favorable for that reaction to occur. 
Once you get this, you have metabolism and you have reproduction. One bubble can splinter into other bubbles. With a protobuoyant now established with some kind of a container containing these molecules, how then do we get a container with molecules, which is basically a cell, to persist over time and reproduce over time? How is it going to pass down the information to make another protobuoyant? Well, it's likely that RNA, ribonucleic acid, is the first genetic material. And there's a lot of reasons for why this would be. It is very simple, only four nucleobases and one in a single stranded, and it is self-replicating. It is able to replicate itself, meaning it can pass down its code of A's, G's, U's, and C's again and again and again. It can carry down and pass down that information. What evidence is there for this? Well, looking today, there has been a tremendous diversity in the evolution of RNA. And you would need a molecule that rapidly evolves to build out all the different combinations necessary for life to then take off. Nowadays, we have mRNAs, rRNAs, tRNAs, single-stranded RNA. The diversity is absolutely sublime. But with DNA, there is very, very little diversity. We just have double-stranded DNA, which you find in most cells, and single-stranded DNA, which is found in some viruses. So because of that, the evidence seems to strongly suggest RNA was the first molecule of heredity. So now we have a container, we have molecules in it, and we have a hereditary molecule, RNA, that can pass information down from generation to generation. Now that we have the making of a first cell, let's see what happens going forward with life from there. Our current research has shown that life likely started around 3.5 to 4 billion years ago. In the fossil record, we feel confident in this because we've found prokaryotic bacterial fossils from about 3.5 billion years ago up to 2 billion years ago. And this was the primary life form discovered in that time period. These prokaryotes dominated Earth. Here on the left-hand side, you can see a fossil of early bacteria that has been dated to 3.5 billion years. On the right, you can see modern bacteria. They are very similar. You can see that just by looking at them, and they operate very similar today as they likely did in the past. Oxygen didn't appear on Earth until about 2.7 billion years ago. The evidence for this is this is when rust appears in our geological record. Looking through all of the rock layers we have access to today, we don't see rust at any time earlier than 2.7 billion years ago. Why is the rust evidence of this? Well, rust can only occur when iron is oxidized, meaning in the presence of oxygen. The oxygen appearing is a huge deal because oxygen is necessary for cellular respiration, the primary process complex organisms use for energy. With the ability of having oxygen to, to obtain and use more energy, this enables huge and complex life forms like you see today and like yourself. So how did this oxygen get here? Well, it was those early prokaryotes that brought it. We didn't have, we had a lot of CO2 in our atmosphere, but not much oxygen or methane. Early prokaryotes were able to do photosynthetic-like processes. They were able to take carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and release oxygen as a waste product. Methanogens did that as well, bacteria that can break down methane and release oxygen. Since they dominated the earth, they pretty much covered the globe and produced so much oxygen that it actually cooled it, bringing most of these species to it, the point of extinction. And this is the majority of the oxygen you breathe in today. So we have a bacterial cell now. We have oxygen on the planet ready to go. How then do we move from a single-celled prokaryote, very, very simple, to something as complex as the eukaryote, the kind of a cell that makes up you. Well, first we'd have to have the formation of internal membranes. You can see on the left there's a bacteria. If parts of the cell membrane on the outside begin to fold in on themselves, they're now going to create self-contained containers. And that is what makes up the majority of structures inside cells. It's something but a piece of membrane folded in on itself. The advantage of this is you get specialization of conditions. You can make the pH, the concentration, the chemistry inside one container completely different than another, enabling the cell to do multiple complex tasks at the same time. After you have this infolding, there's still the need for a strong metabolism, the ability to use that oxygen and make a lot of energy. Right now, the most prominent theory is the endosymbiotic theory as to how early bacteria obtain the mitochondria to be able to do this. So here we have an ancestral eukaryotic cell. 
very likely it engulfed another bacteria, one that was able to get energy from oxygen, but didn't digest it, but instead formed a mutualistic relationship with it. That mutualistic relationship is what we see in cells today. You obtain my ox oxygen and sugar for your mitochondria, your mitochondria breaks it down and returns ATP as energy to you. Both the mitochondria and you benefit. This would have been an evolutionary advantage that all eukaryotic cells carry forward today. Again, the big advantage of this is energy. By having oxygen, you can do cellular respiration, which is tremendously more energy available to those cells than to a cell that does not use oxygen. This is how the structure of the chloroplast formed too. Plants have a chloroplast that they use for photosynthesis. An early prokaryotic cell likely engulfed a photosynthetic bacteria and became friends with it, formed a mutually beneficial relationship that continued forward with all the reproduction in plant cells we see today. There's a lot of evidence for this. On the right, you can see Lynn Marculus. She is the one who put forward this theory and it has been reaffirmed and cooperated again and again and again. This theory of endosymbiosis, just look at the prokaryote, the mitochondria, and the chloroplast. Structurally, they're very, very simple, uh, very, very similar. They all resemble one another. Genetically, they all have their own circular DNA. The mitochondria and the chloroplast in every single one of your cells has DNA that is separate from yours. It is the only organelle, organ in a cell that does that. Prokaryotes also have free-floating DNA. And in function, they're very identical. The mitochondria and the chloroplast in your cells free float. They independently act. They can do whatever they want. All the other organelles are dictated to by the nucleus. Prokaryotes, similar thing. They're free floating. They're doing their own activity. So because of these uncanny similarities, the theory of endosymbiosis seems to make the most sense on how we get a eukaryote. Now that we have a eukaryotic cell, a cell that has a mitochondria chloroplast can obtain a lot of energy, life then exploded in a time period that's referred to as the Cambrian explosion. Here, within a 10 to 20 million year span, we see an explosion of the most animals found in the fossil record. Life now has the energy, the container, the chemistry to exist, and because of natural selection, it exploded out into a huge variety of forms. Here you can see just a small sampling of that diversity. This is when you get things like early trilobites. You can see large plant-like structures forming, weird fish-like creatures forming. And this explosion of life has continued to this day. However, as life has continued in diversity, there have been dramatic events in Earth history that have caused what we call mass extinctions, times where a majority of the biological diversity perishes in a short amount of time. In all of these, it has been almost always caused by short-term climate change. And what I mean by short-term is huge change in climate happening very rapidly, whether it's from volcanic eruptions or as we experience today from human-caused CO2 warming the planet. You are currently living through the sixth great mass extinction event in Earth's history. And this has brought us to the three domains of life we currently see. Domain bacteria, which are like the early Prokaryotes, however, have evolved much more complex structures. Domain archaea, which are bacteria that live in extreme environments, which we think mirror what we would have found in early Earth. And domain eukarya, which are organisms with a nucleus, which make up protists, fungi, plants, and animals like yourself. I hope this was a nice introduction to show you how we can progress from the chemistry we've been learning about to the formation of the first cell. I'll see you all next time.